Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS Windows 95 days. And today, I'll tell you the breaking news of two new Easter eggs that were just discovered or revealed in Windows 95 and Windows NT4. We'll zoom in real tight on my own name for my own vainglorious edification, and I'll tell you why I'm in it and why I'm not in the Windows 95 one, even though I worked on Windows 95. That story and the story of the worst email that I ever sent. We all have one that we'd like back, and this one's mine. So just from a general standpoint, you may know that I'm not a big fan of Easter eggs, at least not in operating systems. Uh, in fact, I've written a ton of shareware in my life, and I've never once put an Easter egg even in a shareware app. Why is that? I'm just not a fan of hidden payloads. So I'm totally cool with if you have an app and you're an, even an operating system, and you want to put credits in it, put it in the help about or wherever it appropriately belongs in your operating system. Don't hide it somewhere that you reveal with some weird, you know, key sequence. To me, the reason for that is that users just don't appreciate hidden payloads. And for one, they're going to be concerned with, in the olden days, how much space and time is this thing taking up. There's one example, I believe it was in Excel, and it was like they, I could be wrong on this, but as I recall, they had pretty much implemented Doom or Quake or Wolfenstein maybe inside of Excel, and people were kind of outraged at the time, like, how much my RAM are you wasting here? And the thing it was, it was all pulled off the disk dynamically. So it did take up a little disk space, but that's not that expensive. The The problem, of course, is RAM and so on. And it wasn't using any of that. People didn't know that. So it kind of gave Easter eggs a bad name about that time. And I think that was one of the, uh, there was another one that was also particularly egregious probably around that time. And that's when the pushback inside Microsoft, I think, really started to develop to the point where we just couldn't have Easter eggs anymore. And like I said, that, that didn't hurt my feelings because I don't think there should be any anyway. And why is that? As I said, if you're running a nuclear reactor, do you really want to wonder if there's code in there? That's one nice thing about open source. You can go look in there and you can see, hey, there's no credit screens, there's no nonsense, there's no monkey business. Um, with a closed system, you don't have that kind of assurance. So I'd kind of like to see, well, it's not really possible. I mean, the company could promise, hey, there's no Easter eggs in here, but then one nut's going to stick something in there, even if it's harmless and that will invalidate the company's promise, and so I imagine that's why they don't make any such promises. But there's never been any malicious code. It's always just been kind of ego-based. Here's a list of names. And the ones in Windows that I've seen have been really, really simple. You may or may not remember it, but there was an internet mail client that came with the Win95 IE4 uh, in that time frame. And the first one, the, the newest one that's just been discovered, that is within that. So let's take a look at that one. So you need to bring up mail, go to help, about, click on com control 32 and then type Mortimer on your keyboard and you'll get this scrolling list. And I know almost none of these people because A, they were in a different group, Win95, working on a different thing, mail. No, well, I know Brad Silverberg and John Ludwig, but it's inspired by them, not written by them. So there you go. Nothing incredibly fancy. List of names. Didn't crash. That's all you asked for, right? Well, maybe we'll get to that and more. The other one that's being featured in the news that's going around, and the one that's generated probably the most email to me this weekend, and kind of what prompted me to make this video, is the NT4 shell update release Easter egg. That's the one where we took all of the Win95 shell code, sort of ported, rewrote it, adapted it for NT to make it suitable for the NT operating system and then gave the code back to Win95 and so they backported it so that we all the, by then had one code base eventually and I think that was for Win98 uh, SE perhaps but I'm not sure exactly what version that first shipped in but whatever version it was when they were finally unified was probably uh, when the shell really became high quality and I don't just mean that because, oh, now we have touched it. What I mean is now you've had the two teams go through the code. It's portable to two operating systems. It's well-designed. It's well-implemented. handles all the cases and so on and so forth. Now, the NT4 shell update release one is a little harder to trigger. I'll post a link in the video description to some text that will explain how to do it. All right, let's see who we've got here. I'll get the flag. The people behind the magic at Windows NT4. The Sir Shell Update Release Shell Team. That'd be me and the other guys. There's me, there's Mark, and John, and Bob, and Rick. 
those are the basic explorer guys and this is going to go by way too fast for me to tell you what everybody did but these are all the people that worked particularly on the shell update release that was the porting of the win95 code base over to windows nt for nt4 who else is in here let's see what other teams they've got thanks a special thanks to the comfy chair that comfy chair that's a story for a different episode and of course is that the stock ticker or the company it's not clear so one of the questions i get a fair bit is why am i not in the windows 95 easter egg if you know how to bring that one up then you'll sit there and it doesn't matter how long you look at it i will never come up and the reason for that is that i started out initially after i moved from ms dos and when i went to nt I started in the Ole RPC team, and we delivered to both Win95 and to Windows NT. And so by that token, I was working on Windows 95. But then I moved to the NT shell team before Windows 95 actually shipped. So I'm not sure the exact dates, but I would say three to four months before the actual shipping of Win95, uh, or the RTM days. I think the code was code already code complete. Yeah, you can't really just move teams when you're in a death march, so I'm pretty sure I didn't boot out of there in the last minute. I'm pretty sure we were code complete and done and my stuff was all settled before I went over to the NT shell team. But when I did that, now I'm on the NT team, so when they take the roster to figure out who's working on Win95 on the ship date, I was not. So even though I had a fair rack of code from the old ARPC side in Win95, I don't even have a ship it for that thing, and I did get invited to the 25th anniversary, so there you go. Oh, oh, pardon me. I was just having a drink here from my... Awesome sauce, Dave's Garage Mug. Check the video description for a link. And now about that email that I sent. Um, so when the Win95 team first announced right near shipping that they had done an Easter egg, somebody on their team, I don't know if it was the guy who actually wrote, or, and I don't know if it was a guy or a girl who wrote the actual Easter egg, but the guy that sent out the email announcing it was Todd. And I'll just call him Todd. Uh, Todd sends out this email and he's like, here's how you trigger the Easter egg. And I believe if I recall, you have to like name a folder with a GUID in it and then open it and you get the clouds thing and the names all scroll by. Well, I'm not a big fan of Easter eggs, as you know. And so I was kind of annoyed and annoyed they didn't tell us because I was in the shell team on the NT side and they didn't even let us know that this was going in. Uh, not that it affected us because we were on the NT side. So this only affected Win95. So, I mean, it's their business. But so I'm a little frustrated. And so I bring the thing up and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just kind of annoyed. What if I can crash this thing? And so I screw around with it for a minute, and then I realize the easiest way to crash this is going to get a divide by zero. So I try to scroll or size the window down to where it's super narrow, and I get down to zero. But you can't. If you take a folder window, you can only get it down to maybe 160 pixels wide or something. It doesn't let you go any smaller. But if you go into Explorer mode where you have the tree pane on the left-hand side, now you can resize the right-hand pane down to zero. And I knew this. So I tried that, and sure enough, within like 30 seconds of even starting, boom, access violation, well not access violation, divide by zero error. So to prove my point that Easter eggs suck and shouldn't be checked into the product, I did a reply all to this huge alias that includes all of Windows 95 and all of NT, and I explained, oh, well, you know, if you do this, there's a bug because it will crash immediately. And this is within, you know, one or two minutes of his email having gone out. And I did this as a reply all. I was a young man, and... Uh, perhaps working with some deficits on the old social spectrum. And uh, yeah, still learning my way in the world, let's just say. Not something I would do today. I would just send a direct email or walk to the guy's office and have a conversation. But so suffice to say, they fixed the divide by zero bug and so on and so forth and, and all as well. And Harmony and cats and dogs living together. Oh, no, wait, that's chaos, isn't it? But I, dig I digress. Why didn't I tell you about these sooner? Well, again, uh, I don't generally reveal stuff that hasn't been leaked by somebody else somewhere. My operating mode is modus operandi, something like that. The way I generally do things is to wait for somebody else to leak the information and then go explain it properly. But I'm not out there leaking a bunch of new information because I respect the NDA that I signed. So if you're new to the channel, this is not a typical video. First of all, they're generally rehearsed and scripted, so I know what the hell I'm saying before I say it. And they're generally on Windows history or contemporary and retro programming topics. So if you're interested in things like the secret history of Task Manager or the secret history of Microsoft Bob, those are episodes on the channel that you should definitely go and check out. And if you already are a fan of the channel, don't forget to grab a Dave's Garage mug. 
well, there's no point in rambling. I'll get back to work on whatever it is that I do, which today actually happens to be the next episode in the software drag racing series, which this time is the Mac M1 versus the Threadripper versus the Raspberry Pi. Yes. Does the Pi stand a chance or are its dreams just a little too big? You may think you know how that part works out, but I'm telling you the M1 versus Threadripper, a little weird and confusing. Be sure to check it out. It's the next episode coming up, so subscribe to the channel. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.